Hello, welcome. Um, thanks for coming to Grand Rounds today. Um, today we have Matt Weed, who's gonna talk to us about uh, taking a history. He is uh, currently in practice up in Spokane, but uh, did a fellowship, did a residency at Iowa, fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology at Iowa, as well as a uh, fellowship in uh, genetics at, at Iowa. So um, we are happy to hear from him today. He's a great guy, so. All right. Let's see. Well, so uh, I'm Matt Weed, like Mimi said, and I'm honored and excited to be here with you today. Um, I was invited to give this presentation as part of uh, my application for the pediatric ophthalmology position here on faculty. And I chose this topic about the utility of listening and asking the right questions in the eye clinic, not because I'm an expert at it, but more because it's something that I'm interested in and it's something that I'm learning more about and something that I'm hoping to improve on. And then, so let's see, I think I can just advance the slides right here, Ethan, is that right? You want to show me that presenter mode too? That'd be great. Perfect. There we go. The clicker, Beautiful. Clicker to look forward. Awesome. Thank you. So I thought I'd just take a minute and tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a, a full-time pediatric ophthalmologist and adult strabismus specialist currently in practice in Washington State. And I know that um, for some of us, the prospect of seeing like a child in the exam room or worse yet in the emergency room when you're on call can inspire like this sort of reaction right here where it's just a terrifying prospect, but not for me. I really like kids. I love being a pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, I love the bread and butter like amblyopia and strabismus. I love the zebras that come in occasionally as well. And I love talking to almost all the parents. Um, I'm also, like Mimi said, a fellowship trained inherited retinal disease specialist. And as part of my practice each week, I see pediatric patients who are known or suspected to have uh, retinal dystrophies. And I really enjoy this part of my practice as well because I like being an expert in that field. And I'm really excited about the future you know, of inherited retinal disease within our, our field of ophthalmology. I'm from here. I went to Olympus High. I went to BYU for college. I did uh, med school at UC San Diego. And then like Mimi said, uh, my residency and fellowships at Iowa. Um, I'm married. This is my wife, Mallory. We've got four kids. Uh, I could talk for like a couple hours on the subject of barbecue. These are some ribs that I did recently. And I like to backpack a lot. So anyway, this is our subject for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, the patient history, specifically the patient history in the eye clinic. And I'd like to talk about why uh, the history has been de-emphasized in our field over time why I think it's still important, and then share just a couple of cases where the history really helped figure out what was going on with the patient. So why does it sometimes get overlooked? Well, in our field, the eye exam is super accessible, especially relative to other fields of medicine. Oftentimes, we can just look inside the eye and get a quick idea or a really good idea of what's going on without having to rely as much on the patient history. With so many different types of diagnostic imaging, available to us now, things like wide field fundus imaging, high resolution OCT, uh, MRI scanning, whole genome or whole exome sequencing. It can be easy to rely on uh, diagnostic testing modalities and less on history taking. It also takes time and we've all got a lot of patients that we wanna see and take care of. Um, it may not take as much time as we think. I, I did see one study that showed that the average time to interruption when a patient starts talking to when a physician breaks in is like 11 seconds, which seems really short. So it might take a little bit longer than that, but um, it does take a little bit of time. There's also this idea of confirmation bias where we might already have a pretty good idea before the patient even opens their mouth, maybe even before we go in the room as to what a patient has or what they're coming in for. Maybe we've read the referring records from the referring doctor, or maybe we've looked at the chart to see what the technician put in the history. And these things can be helpful, but they can also um, cause us to not focus as much on the history and we may uh, overlook some things. In 2021, the evaluation and management coding system here in the United States changed. And it meant that the uh, sole determinant of the e &M coding level was the medical decision-making, medical complexity and specific history 
and exam elements were no longer needed. So that's another reason why history may be de-emphasized. So why should we still care about it? Well, it's part of our job. It's one of the things that we're expected to do and what we're paid to do. It's also helpful. There are some diagnoses that can only be made through taking a, a history. And this isn't just for the super rare, complicated things that you might see just once in a while. It's not just for the diagnoses in the neuro-op clinic. Uh, it's for things as simple and as common as whether a cataract is truly visually significant or not. Okay, so this, this handsome chap here, does anyone know who this is? It's, it's obviously a vintage photo. This is Sir William Osler. He's the father of modern medicine. He founded Johns Hopkins. Um, he started the first medical residency program. And he was a brilliant, apparently, uh, diagnostician. And one of his famous sayings was that if you listen to your patient carefully enough, they will tell you the diagnosis. Um, and I have found that to be true in, in certain circumstances. Also, taking a history allows us to parse through data for relevance. Uh, we've got a lot of information available to us now. And we see this in the inherited retinal disease space where uh, single patient genetic data is increasingly available. There is a company called Blueprint Genetics that will do a 351 gene panel for patients suspected to have inherited retinal disease for free. And it's great because these patients can get genetic testing for free, but it's also a little bit tricky because the human genome has uh, over 3 billion base pairs in it, and there's 20,000 different genes. And each of us, just by random chance, has thousands and thousands, if not millions of mutations where our DNA differs from the consensus sequence. And most of these mutations cause absolutely no clinical condition at all, either because they don't change the uh, codon in the mRNA, or they don't change the amino acid that it's coding for, or they don't change the protein enough to cause clinically meaningful disease. But when you're testing um, 20,000 separate genes or 351 separate genes in these panels, you'll get a lot of data, and some of it will be meaningful and some of it will not. An analogy in, in general medicine is if we were to do whole body MRIs on every patient every year, uh, regardless of what they were actually coming in for, we would get a lot of data and a lot of it would be totally meaningless. It wouldn't be clinically significant at all, but we'd have to figure out what to do with it. And the history is where we can help figure out what is real and what is meaningful and distinguish that from what is bogus. Also patients, I think, like it. I think people like to be heard. They want to feel like they're being interacted with and not just uh, like in a veterinary clinic where they're examined and then treated. Um, and during the history is when we can make eye contact and take some time. It doesn't have to be a super long thing. It can be done efficiently, but we can, we can engage. And also it's fun. Uh, sometimes you'll hear really interesting stories and I have a couple to, to share with you today. So we got some cases. First case, this is two things in one. So this is a five-year-old male he was referred to see me for suspected retinitis pigmentosa. This is a retinal dystrophy, as you know, that causes progressive vision loss. He had a strong family history of RP. His mom had it, and several of her family members had it as well. Nobody in the family had had genetic testing, and there are dozens and dozens of different RP genes. Again, no one in the family had ever been tested. So stepping back a little bit, because inherited eye disease is a really complicated subject, I found it very helpful to ask these same seven questions to every new patient that comes into the uh, inherited disease clinic to see me. Like any history, this helps establish some rapport with the family. Um, it lets them know that they are heard and it helps me start to place this patient's condition in a category. So for example, if they were to say that the first uh, sign that they noticed was nystagmus after the child was born and then they never had useful vision, then I would be thinking about genes that can cause labor congenital amaurosis. If they said that the child had totally normal vision until roughly age nine or 10, and then they started to gradually lose their central vision, we'd be thinking about Stargardt disease. So it helps to just place it in a category and kind of get things started. And these are questions that uh, you can ask, or you can train your, your technicians to ask if you see these type of patients regularly. So back to this patient, he's five suspected to have RP, referred by a local ophthalmologist. And in his case, I give a lot of credit to Samantha, who's the technician I was working with at the time, because during her workup of this patient, she elicited some pretty curious findings. Um, family reported that this child was both night blind and really sensitive to bright light. And this, in my experience, is a really unusual combination, even for patients that have known retinal dystrophies. It's almost always just one or the other, 
And if they say it's both, um, it's a patient who has some overlay typically. But this family swore that their five-year-old could not see in dim light and was also really sensitive to bright light. So made note of that. They also said that he wasn't even on the growth chart. He was super short for his age and that their pediatrician had, had evaluated this and said that he just needed to eat more. And uh, mom also reported that um, although this may have been a bit of an exaggeration, that he needed to drink his body weight in water every day. He was super thirsty all the time. On exam, he was 2050 in each eye. Uh, we had normal pupils and motility and alignment. His visual fields had some peripheral constriction to confrontation in both eyes. And then let's see if this shows. Yeah, it shows up nicely. So this is a representative image of, of what this condition looks like. Um, would anyone be willing to describe some findings that they see here? Anybody? And if not, I can do it. Does anyone want to take a stab at it? Common of the resin stick stab, would you see? Oh, sure. Seems to be some crystalline deposits. Yeah. yeah, excellent. That was really good. What's your name? Uh, I'm Tony. Tony. That's absolutely correct. So this uh, child's cornea at slit lamp exam was packed with thousands of needle-shaped crystals in both eyes. Um, here's his fundus exam. And you can see the right eye and the left eye. Um, you can note that in the temporal periphery, predominantly in both eyes, he's got some numular black pigment deposition with overlying atrophy. And then also, yeah, they show up here too, um, crystals in the retina as well. Okay. And a symmetric, symmetric presentation. Take a look at this OCT here and tell me if anyone sees something here that is, is present that should not be. And also if, if you notice that there's something missing that should be there. When you look here, what do you notice? <laughs> yeah. Right, so those are great comments. Thank you. There are uh, crystalline deposits in the inner retina. Um, this is a little bit of an eccentric scan, this raster. So good point, there could be fibrofoveal hypoplasia in this patient due to photophobia, the fixation wasn't perfect. And this is a little bit offline here. Also note, as you get outside of the fovea, the loss of the ellipsoid zone, outer retinal atrophy with uh, foveolar presentation or preservation there. Okay, so what's going on here? We've got a child with reduced vision. He's nyctalopic and photophobic at the same time. He's short. He drinks a ton of water every day. Strong family history of RP with corneal crystals, a crystalline retinopathy, and some numular pigment in the retinal periphery. Does anyone have an idea of what's going on here? How would you put this, put this case together? Any thoughts? Yeah, okay, so that's part of it for sure. So this is two totally separate... Mendelian disorders in the same patient. He has autosomal dominant RP like his mom and her relatives, and that's what's causing him to be night blind and him to have peripheral retinal atrophy and the pigment deposition that you see. But he also, like you said, has cystinosis, and that's an autosomal recessive condition. This is a lysosomal storage disease that's caused by cysteine buildup, which is the oxidized dimer of the amino acid cysteine. And that's why he's light sensitive, because his corneas are packed with crystals. That's why he's short. This is the most common cause of Fanconi anemia in children. And it was formerly fatal, if not treated by age 10 or so, because it causes renal failure. Um, their kidneys um, don't function properly in the proximal tubule. They get a bunch of protein and glucose in their urine. And that's what leads to the excessive thirst and urination. So now it's treatable. So how do we prove our hypothesis here? Uh, we did cystinosis testing and his, his levels were 100 times normal. Um, we did genetic testing for RP and found that he has this ARG-135 trip mutation in the rhodopsin gene, which was the first uh, described RP gene. And this same mutation was also found in his mom. And in terms of like, how do we help him? It's great that we know this stuff now, but what can we do for him? Uh, topical cystiamine eye drops can help with the crystalline uh, keratopathy. And systemic cystiamine can help with the nephropathy that he, that he would develop. He's been referred to nephrology as doing great. And there's the hope of future gene-specific treatments for his RP. How did asking the right questions help us here? Uh, well, without getting the family history of RP, we could have attributed all of those retinal findings just to cystinosis. 
without the history of his poor growth and short stature and his prodigious thirst, um, it would have been potentially easy to not be on the lookout for something systemic, especially if we hadn't been able to get a good slit lamp exam. And that's what had happened with his prior ophthalmologist, um, that those corneal findings had been had, had not been observed. And then finally, without the history telling us that he was both uh, sensitive to bright light and had trouble in dim light, we might not have had a, as big of a suspicion for two things going on at once. All right, case two, this is called monkey wrench. This is a 26 year old male. He was referred for strabismus to see me in a, the adult strabismus clinic. He said that his right eye had been drifting up and out for the past year. And he was there with mom in the exam room that day. And she said that it's been getting worse. He said that he'd never seen double, that he hadn't had any treatment for his, his strabismus in the past. And as far as, as they said, his only eye problem was the strabismus and the fact that he needed glasses. And mom said, you know, I really want him to get his eyes fixed um, and get better pair of glasses. He's never had a great pair of glasses, she said. I want him to get these things fixed so that he can drive. Okay, so he's 2060 in both eyes um, with correction. He's myopic, astigmatic. Uh, he's got normal pupils. He, it seemed like he had some trouble understanding the confrontation fields testing, or maybe it truly was constricted peripherally. And then interestingly, he had some uh, PSC cataract in both eyes, and there were some anterior vitreous cells that were visible through his undilated pupil on exam. And so that's why this is a monkey wrench. Uh, we've, I think we've all got patients like this who we think, and they themselves might think that they've got one thing, and like, that's why you're here to see me today, sir or ma'am. And then we realize wait a minute, there's like something else going on here. And these patients can be challenging because when we realize that there's more going on than, than they knew or that we knew, it brings up some questions like, like, what am I going to do about this? You know, he's here to see me for his business. He's got another eye doctor. Uh, maybe they could work this up. Maybe I, maybe I should work it up. How would I do that? And there's different ways to handle patients like this. Uh, in his case, I, I chose to do a full dilated eye exam, and uh, I don't usually do that for adults that come to see me for strabismus, but that's what we did. And here were his uh, fundus findings. One more volunteer to describe what they see here. Don't worry, Mimi, I'm not going to call on you. Correct. That was really good. Thank you. Um, one other thing to note is the uh, retinal arterioles, which don't show up as well on this screen, are, are really attenuated in both eyes. On OCT, he also demonstrates uh, outer retinal atrophy and loss of the ellipsoid zone in both eyes. So he's 26, he's hypoglycemic for strabismus, and he obviously has an undiagnosed retinal dystrophy. They say that he was 2030 in both eyes a few years ago. Now he's, he's worse than that. Um, we found out that he, he lived at home with mom and that he had an eighth grade reading level and a speech delay and two siblings, neither of whom had anything like this. And so when you see this presentation, uh, does something like this, does this ring any bells to anybody? Does this seem like something like, is it that thing? Anybody have any idea what's going on here with case two, Monkey Ranch? Yeah. So I had a thought. Um, I I turned to mom and, and this patient and I said, were you by chance born with an extra finger or toe? And mom's eyes got as big as saucers. And she's like, how did you know? And she said that, yes, he had been born with an extra finger on the ulnar side of each hand. And she said, well, you might as well know dad and I are second cousins. And um, so this is syndromic RP and a specific type of syndromic RP. Retinitis pigmentosa can either occur in isolation 
or as part of a systemic syndrome. And the two most common syndromes are Usher syndrome, which is RP plus sensory neural hearing loss. And there's a couple different types of that. And uh, BDS or Bardet Beetle syndrome. This is what this patient has. He has RP and developmental delay. They get obesity often because the satiety center and the hypothalamus is dysfunctional and they don't realize that they're full. And so they keep eating. Uh, ulnar polydactyly can be present usually on the hands, but sometimes on the feet as well. And we did genetic testing with this patient and he had homozygous M390R mutations in the BBS1 gene, which is the most common mutation in the most common BBS gene. In terms of how we can help him, we did cataract surgery, uh, eventually business surgery, genetic counseling, and there's hope for future gene-specific treatments for him as well. The history helped us here because we knew that since they thought that he just needed a good pair of glasses and had no other medical conditions, apparently, that any new findings on exam would be a new diagnosis to him. Um, the social history of him being there with mom brought up the possibility of undiagnosed developmental delay. And then once we got that history of the polydactyly, that basically clinched the diagnosis and helped guide genetic testing. You've got one more quick case. This is hot case. This came in yesterday. I had this presentation already. And then uh, yesterday at about noon, I saw this patient. I said, oh, I've got to get this one. So this is hot case. This is a 16-year-old male. Um, he was referred by his local optometrist for a suspected macular dystrophy. And he reported decreased central vision in both eyes over the past few months with no family history, medically well, no medications. He was about 2060, 2070 in each eye with an uh, unremarkable amount of refractive error and anterior segment. These are the images that his optometrist had obtained uh, three months ago um, before I, I met him just yesterday. So you can see in the macula in each eye, there are some yellow deposits and you see some changes in the outer retina at the fovea in both eyes. This is bilateral, it's symmetric. There's yellow stuff in the macula. And I think that considering an inherited retinal disease in this situation is very reasonable. Um, the referring doctor was concerned for something like Best disease or Stargardt disease. And looking at these, you could say, okay, you know, there's a chance that that's what this is. But then when I met him yesterday, things looked quite different. Um, this is the, the appearance here. So you can see that over the course of just a few months, um, those yellow deposits or that yellow appearance, I should say, has changed into uh, black, black um, colored areas centered on the fovea in each eye. So the question is, what is the key question here? There's one question that you can ask this patient that will make this diagnosis. Oh, someone said it. Who said it? Say it out loud. Silver macula. Yeah. So had this happened before or after after early April, I was I would be thinking this is solar retinopathy. The fact that these um, yellow areas in his macula presented back in January let me know that it was likely not that. And so I asked, is there any chance that you've gotten a laser pointer shined in your eyes? And he got this look on his face, this knowing like the jig is up situation because he's really, you know, well-educated child and hadn't really talked to mom about this at all. And then the history comes tumbling out that they had bought a laser pointer on Timu, the website, and that maybe he had looked at it for just a, a few seconds or two. And so unfortunately now he's got permanent uh, laser pointer retinopathy. So in sum, as we wrap up, Listening and asking the right questions can be essential, even in ophthalmology. Uh, it can be done efficiently. Occam's razor doesn't always apply. Sometimes patients can have more than one condition at the same time. Uh, a patient's eye findings can have serious implications for their systemic health, and we can, uh, we can tease those out sometimes and, and truly help someone, not just from an eye perspective, but from their systemic standpoint as well. RP in a patient who has polydactyly is BBS until proven otherwise. Uh, lasers are not toys. And laser pointer retinopathy can mimic an inherited retinal dystrophy. And finally, sometimes patients have incredibly helpful and surprising things to say if we, if we listen and ask the right questions. And um, I think we've got a minute or two for questions or comments. Maybe you've got experiences that you've had that have helped you take a really good history or surprising findings that you know, you'd like to share. I'd be happy to take any questions or listen to any comments if anybody has any. Dr. Olson. No, oh, kind of association with this. I think it's great. And you represent something that sadly I was losing more and more is asking a few questions of 
I was just reading a review uh, by a professor who talked about having rounds and a patient being presented with diabetes with uh, bilateral uh, BK amputations. And he asked, well, when did that happen? And everybody went to the medical record and they said, well, it's been in this person's last three admissions. So, you know, it's been at least for several years. He said, well, how can we easily find that out? And everybody's looking at the record, turn to the patient, says, when did you have both of your legs amputated? So he said, I've never had much leg amputated. So he pointed out by forwarding the record and nobody bothering. And this was this was with a medical student and, and a you know and an intern and and with all of the different lineup that everybody just took the electronic medical record and nobody bothered to even look and notice the fact that there had never been any amputations. And sadly, I, that's part of where we, you know, we need to be more involved. And, and I know part of the problem is we're so focused in regards to the electronic medical record that it's, it's often harder to take time. And I wish that weren't so, but we, 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 we need to be able to do these kinds of things and do a better job with those patients. So well done. Thank you. Any other comments? Great talk. I mean, part of why I chose ophthalmology or PD, even pediatric ophthalmology is because you don't have to do, you know, much of this history taking. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, you can kind of look and see what you find, but you, it is important. And I, I think, and sometimes I miss it, you know, just in the, I've got so many patients and I can just figure it out and I don't need to ask so many questions. Um, yeah, and also it's, it's nice to remember that making those human connections is, is really what makes their visit more um, uh, enjoyable for them. And then also they're more follow up and, uh, you know, follow your recommendations. Yeah, I think asking a patient, you know, what bothers them the most or what's the most like um, disconcerting thing about their disease is always very interesting because sometimes they'll be like, yeah, your eyes look really red. They're like, they do? Oh, that doesn't bother me, it's this, you know? Yeah. Um, and then also just if you're <laughs> evaluating a lesion, it's good to have the patient like point to the lesion. I had this guy who heard this really contact kind of cyst yeah. he, that had like just occurred over the last six months. And I got like cell line photos and interior segment of CT. I had been following him for, I would say like, six months. And then at our second or third visit, he was like, oh, that, no, I have that, had that since I was three. I got poked in the eye and it's always been there. I'm talking about this pink webula. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I have been looking at the wrong thing and taking pictures of the wrong thing. And only when I pointed it out to him on the, like on his photo, like, yeah, this like, you know, weird looking like scar tissue. He's like, oh no, that doesn't bother me. It's that yellow thing. And I was like, oh my God, I feel so stupid. So <laughs> I think that also just not getting lost in what he's like, you said, confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. Like me thinking that this weird thing that's atypical is what he's actually bothered by, but it's really this very common thing that um, I think that's also very important. It's a great comment. I, even for a new patient, I often like to ask, what are you most hoping to get from today's visit? Because we might think they, that we know you might have no idea what they really care about. And if we missed it, then we missed it. Anything else before we move on to the next part of the grand rounds this morning? Thanks, everybody. Thank